Humankind is coming out with its very first DLC. So I think it's appropriate for us to do a little bit of React content here and uh, see how she goes. Uh, we've got Bantu, Garamanti. So this is all Cultures of Africa DLC feature focus. Let's have a look at the trailer. We'll, we'll go through this whole list, I reckon. Six new cultures from Africa. We've got the Bantu. I already know a little bit about some of these things. I've watched a few of them. Swahili. Cool, cool, cool. Now, I believe in accompaniment with this patch, there will also be a fairly substantial gameplay patch. Like, we're talking balance. We're talking potentially, like couple of fixes probably I think the game has actually had quite a lot of bug fixing patches I really like the way the buildings look and it looked like there was a couple of new world wonders in there um, this looks like the mosque of Jenny I don't I actually don't know um, so that was the this let's go look at the feature for the feature focus Kim and Cultures of Africa feature focus Welcome to this introduction of the first DLC for Humankind Cultures cool. of Africa This culture pack will feature six cultures from Africa one per era the Bantu the Garamantes the Swahili, the Maasai, the Ethiopians, and the Nigerians. That's All of one them will culture. bring new interesting ways to play humankind through new units. Or one like per the era, rather. Let's have a look. Well, so we will get a chance to look at the Bantu ability. Dutch and Bloom Garamantes legacy trait, or the Emba, the gorgeous Ethiopian emblematic quarter. Okay. Mixing these new cultures with the 60 existing ones will bring even more uniqueness to your civilization. But these new cultures are not the only new content brought by the Cultures of Africa pack. By exploring the world, you will be able to discover four new natural wonders. I like that, the that's really cool. in Africa, the Mount Kilimanjaro, Mount Kilimanjaro, Victoria Falls, Zuma Rock in Nigeria, and the impressive bright red lake Netron. Uh, if I'm going to give like a little bit of feedback to the humankind developers here, I think the one failing I feel of the natural wonders is they all do the same thing. Um... They all do the same thing. They give you like a little bit of a benefit and a little bit of influence and they're kind of cool to have. Um, they give you a little bit of fame. Um, I think Hugh, one of, one of the criticisms I would levy against the natural wonders, these are all incredible and cool things. Uh, but the, the thing that really excites and interests players is if these things have unique mechanics associated with them give them adjacency to district you can start off real like you could just do some pretty normal basic stuff to to, to make these seem really cool um but I, th I think as it stands these are all really cool thematically but kind of boring from a gameplay perspective so if you care a lot about the thematics of the game um this is a really really cool development if you're kind of more of a mechanics kind of guy like me it just it it's cool but it like it doesn't excite me new new natural wonders I'll, I'll be honest with you you will also be able to claim and build a brand new cultural wonder the great mosque of jenny that Built around the, great the 13th century jenny. this architectural marvel is one of the most unique buildings in africa which has been designated world heritage site by unesco since 1988. on top of all of this content Cultures of Africa will feature 15 new exciting in-game events. Some of so we're getting 15 new in-game events. Um, these were... I liked the in-game events. 
I still f- I feel that they are I think honestly the Forex game that did events the best so far in my opinion is Old World. Old World does events in like a really interesting and engaging way. I know it's harder for humankind to do events in the same way that Old World does them because Old World is like an entire it's like a Crusader Kings light with a whole character system and an entire wealth of that built around that. Um I mean more events is cool. Um it'll flesh out the system. I do think that 15 events feels really light. Um, I'm pretty sure some Paradox DLCs come with 150 events. Um, So 15, now these are going to have to want to be really good events. Um, The big problem with the events system is that the most interesting consequences of the event system is actually like the ideological outcome but the ideology of your nation doesn't actually like have too much of an impact on gameplay it's like just like a modifying slider that moves back and forth so um because so much weight of the event system is put into that system and it's not interesting enough um yet it could be more interesting um yeah this feels i think i think the whole chance of triggering another narrative event these tooltips need to be a little bit more explanatory but this could be interesting this could be really really interesting um i i do feel like these new events um my feeling is these events are going to be better than the old ones because they kind of they've learned the system they figured out what works and they figured out what players like of them unfolding through multiple eras as well as seven new independent people factions to spice up your Humankind games. Humankind Cultures of Africa pack will be available on January 20th. You can pre-order it right now at a discounted price. So it'll actually we'll be available tomorrow, which will be today in when upcoming videos. YouTube frogs so are watching this video. Um, so that's cool. That's cool. Uh, now we get to check out the six new cultures that are coming with this. Um, so probably, man, the Nuzlocke is getting pushed back further. Tomorrow we'll probably stream Humankind um, when this new expansion comes out. Uh, let's go ahead and go through the cultures, I reckon. We've got the Bantu culture focus. If the Bantu languages today form one of the most widely spoken language families in Africa, Their spread across the continent began nearly 6,000 years ago. Mm -hmm. Between the 4th and 3rd millennium before Common Era, Bantufon peoples began a series of migrations, known as the Bantu Expansion, creating many population centers across Africa. Okay. Were the migrations ever present? One of the big weaknesses, I think, that... um, humankind has compared to civilization is because they're focusing on cultures and not people um the individual stories of cultures are a little bit less sellable in the sense that it's much easier to tell a story about alexander than it is to tell a story about macedon right you could say alexander conquered the world he did all this crazy he was insane it was ridiculous and it's a little bit harder to kind of tell a story about macedon and like sell people on it i think Humankind is a little bit more impersonal in that way, which isn't necessarily a bad thing, but it is a criticism of the game and that it's probably contributing to its uh, slightly less popularity, probably. ...presented by their expansionist orientation. The spread of their language, culture, and their ability to merge with the local peoples they encountered is reflected in their legacy trait, oh gosh, harmonious so amalgamation. Quiet. This trait gives them additional influence on territories bordering other empires, allowing... So... Plus two influence per number of adjacent empires on territory. So that's good for expansion. Um, automatically upgrades to a regular outpost. Okay. So these are the ancient era guys. ...them to spread their influence into their opponent's territories. The first Bantufon groups to undertake these migrations were also farmers and are said to have grown pearl millet as their main source of food. This and the fact they probably practiced slash and burn cultivation could explain their ability to adapt to the different environments they travel through. The Bantu's agricultural practices and their adaptability are reflected through their emblematic quarter, the Mupia field. It is a special outpost that provides food to nearby cities, regardless of the terrain it is placed on. 
In our in-game reconstruction, we decided to represent the band to expansion as a globally peaceful dynamic. Indeed, it would seem that the Bantu migrations were facilitated by their social organization and that it generally pushed them to mix with the indigenous populations they encountered. Their emblematic unit, the pioneer, reflects the migratory nature of their expansion. Pioneers can grow on the move by picking up food curiosities That's and really can cool. be turned into an outpost instantaneously without spending any influence. That's really, really cool. In humankind, there are well over a million culture combinations each providing unique gameplay possibilities and rich stories, like the band 2. We can't wait to see how far you will push humankind. I don't think the, the million culture combination thing is kind of like... I don't know, it's, it's the same sort of thing as like, oh, you'll shuffle a deck of cards, you'll never have the same cards twice. It's like, it's a cool little fact, but I don't think it sells your game. Um, I do think that this culture here, the Bantu, is a much, uh, much more mature uh, design than some of the cultures that came out on launch. Um, in terms of like actually like they figured out what works in the game, what makes the game interesting. This is an interesting legacy trait. It's reasonably powerful. It's not insanely powerful. Um, This is quite cool. This is this is reasonable. So it's kind of they're fitting into an expansionist sort of mindset. They get um, outposts that generate extra food for nearby cities, so they can grow really early. Um, that kind of works with expansionists. So they grow by expanding, and then they can expand more uh, by building these units. I think this is a really well designed ancient era sieve that is like going to be able to claim a lot of land really early. I think this will be like a top tier sieve um, or culture. A, on a larger map with a lot of land because you'll be able to just claim maybe three four maybe five more um pieces of territory in the ancient era than you would with another civilization unless you like roll the natural wonder this is a really interesting sieve i like it i think that's cool for an ancient era sieve i would i would you know i'm interested in playing these guys i think it would be kind of fun to do an all africa run where you play all the new dlcs saves one after another and i wonder if they were actually designed at all with that sort of gameplay in mind let's go ahead and go on to the garamantes Between the 17th and 14th century before Common Era, a major ecological mutation changed the environment of the Sahara. The lack of rain transformed the region into a desert area and disrupted the way of life of human communities. Through farmers of the desert, the Garamantes fully adapted to this new environment and experienced a remarkable boom between the 4th century before Common Era and the 3rd century. This phenomenon is reflected in their agrarian orientation and their legacy. I will say this, in contrast to the thing where I said about characters earlier, I personally am super interested in like cultures and cultural history and like cultural practice and stuff like that. Um, and I think pretty much anybody who plays a Civ type game is um, in any way. Um, so uh, this is actually a really good opportunity for me to learn about other cultures in a way that's interesting. Um, so that could be a hook that the humankind developers can use to great effect here with these developer videos. So we'll talk a little bit more about the Garamanti's abilities here in a moment though. Citrate Desert in Bloom. This generates additional influence in their cities while their population is growing, allowing them to expand, pass laws, or claim wonders quickly if they maintain a good food supply. In particular, they were able to take advantage of this hostile environment thanks to the Fogera system. This made it possible to cultivate wheat, barley, vines, olives, and date palms. Fogaras in humankind can be built anywhere in your territory to harvest food from ties that do not normally produce it, allowing you to grow your population in otherwise infertile areas. As experts in horse breeding and training, the Garamontes were renowned for being excellent riders. They were known for approaching the enemy without engaging in combat and harassing them by throwing darts to lure them onto unfavorable terrain. The Garamontes javelin cavalry can slip past the enemy lines to deliver a short range volley and fall back to make room for your other units to join the fray. This is a super powerful classical era unit, 27 combat strength, 
ranged move after attack. Uh, so an important thing about move after attack conceptually for video games like that are tactical in nature. Um, normally, one of the biggest limiters of like combat for choke points and stuff like that is like if you imagine there's like a frontage and there's two spaces on that front, you can get two units. I'm doing horns. You can get two units like fighting. Okay. Uh, if you have a unit that can move in, attack, and leave, this is as if the frontage has now become infinite, right? So this is why units that can attack and move in these games are incredibly powerful. It's almost like you can stack the units onto a single tile and attack all together. Um, so that's, and, and it's ranged, so it doesn't suffer melee counterattacks when it attacks. Very, very powerful. Very, very powerful uh, unit here. In humankind, there are well over a million culture combinations each providing unique gameplay possibilities and rich stories like the Garamantes. We can't wait to see how far you will push humankind. Very, very cool. Um, that is pretty neat. I like the Garamantes. They have, they're an agrarian sieve, so they're very growth focused. I'm curious as to how the growth focus stuff has changed. The plus five influence on main plaza if the city is growing is actually very significant in this phase of the game. This is where influence is still important, but it's be, you know, sort of uh, a little bit more abundant. So a plus five per city feels weak when you're going to have maybe two cities by this point in the game. Maybe three if you had a really good early game. Ten Is ten influence significant? It's like having another natural wonder. I guess it's okay. It's good. It, this is good. It comes a little late, but it does scale based on the number of cities. I would say this is okay. The desert in bloom. Um, it's very easy to maintain growing cities, especially if you have something like the Fogara. I like the design of the Fogara. This is a fantastic sort of flipping on the head of the current district system. It's a district that you're, it's a quarter that you can build away from your city, which you can't do right now. They have to be connected contiguously. So you can build it uh, away from your city to exploit land and you can exploit sterile terrain. So this opens up settling opportunities that maybe other civilizations wouldn't consider. Um, so I, I like this. This is cool. I really like the Javelin Rider. So everything about the Garamantes feels strong and thematic and well designed and like it's all working together. I would say the, the, the most interesting thing is the Javelin Rider and the Fogara. Um, where in contrast, the, the other save I felt like had way more going for it. Um, the Javelin Riders are really interesting. Uh, they're going to be a fun unit to use for early warfare. Um, the question is, is the save going to have the production to actually pump those out in a reasonable amount? Um, the Fogara is also interesting. I think these other, you know, otherwise it's a it's just an okay save um, with some growth bonuses. I think it's a unique enough save to be, to be interesting. I like it. Uh, so then we'll go ahead and check out the Swahili. The shores of East Africa were integrated early on into the trade routes that run through the Indian Ocean, the Red Sea, and the Mediterranean. These sustained and prolonged contacts with the world formed the breeding ground for Swahili culture, which flourished there between the 10th and 15th centuries. <coughs> the Swahili world is inseparable from the coastal towns, which form a series of prosperous states, united by a common urban, commercial, and Islamic culture. Integrated to the trade networks spanning the Indian Ocean, the Swahili are a merchant culture in humankind. Since most of their trade hubs were coastal cities, they will benefit from increased stability in the harbors with their legacy trade, coastal haven. That seems really cool. Lots of stability on harbors. Important merchant families generally live... The, the big problem with harbors in humankind is how expensive they are, so I'm not sure that stability really helps, um, but sure. ...in great buildings devoted to commercial activities which were symbols of prestige and wealth. One of the biggest of these buildings was the Usuni Kubwa of Kilwa Kisiwani, veritable palace in which textiles, ceramics, and glassware were stored. As the Bandari played a crucial role in dealing with foreign... Veritable palace was the Usuni Kubwa of Kilwa Kisiwani, veritable ah. palace in which textiles, ceramics, and glassware Kilwa Kisawani's in the game. Cool. As the Bandari played a crucial role in dealing with foreign merchants and their varied wares, this emblematic harbor will provide you with more money for each type of resource you have access to, making a far-reaching trade network extra valuable. 
this flexible trade networks already feel like incredibly powerful in humankind so making them more powerful is good i guess if you want to have a strong sieve um, especially about this is the phase of the game where those trade routes really start to kick in i think this is a medieval era sieve so cool on robust ships designed for cargo transportation on the high seas had large loading capacities and could dock on beaches and mangroves Thanks to its shallow draft, the MTP can beach with ease, allowing your units to embark and disembark quickly without harbors to assist them. This gives Swahili armies great mobility in coastal areas and islands. In humankind, there are well over a million culture combinations, each providing unique gameplay possibilities and rich stories, like the Swahili. So I, I'm interested in this sieve. Um, the the boat is kind of like an interesting mechanic your units can embark and disembark really easily um i'm not sure is that like really strong enough a theme for a sieve to make them interesting enough i don't know they're it's okay i would say that's moderately interesting i wonder if those trans if now if their transports have higher combat strength than other transports of a similar era this will be an incredibly dominant naval sieve like untouchably dominant um in terms of like you just won't want to go to early naval war against them um so that that seems quite powerful to get it that early in medieval era to be able to do that sort of stuff when naval warfare in medieval is only really getting off the ground they'll be able to completely dominate um especially because it's a transport unit so like if you have like a gang of scouts hanging around from the ancient era and you just embark them suddenly you've got an like a naval suddenly you have a navy right um so that's incredibly powerful they've also got coastal haven i think the stability on harbor and then stability on harbor per adjacent regular district that's interesting um harbors are hard to build things beside so um, this also has a little bit of push-pull tension because you want harbors to have as much open ocean next to them as possible so that typically means you're minimizing how many districts you can build next to them you ba -ba 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 -ba, and it's hard to build districts beside harbors so this is a bit of a push-pull tension this doesn't feel that good but they do have a unique harbor that gives plus three money per unique type of resource available that's quite good it doesn't scale with trade routes but it does scale with the number of resources so trade is still import important but it's not the be all end all quite a, i would say this is quite a powerful district it's quite good you know harbor ha unique harbors are always good because of the potential scaling you have with all other mechanics in humankind this is a reasonably strong and interesting sieve i'm excited for swahili swahili will be fun uh let's have a look at the maasai click Have you seen anything that looks blatantly OP yet? Between the, 16th the first sieve that can like convert scouts into outposts. I don't know if that seemed OP, but it seemed interesting, really interesting. ...established themselves as one of the main groups among the pastoral societies that dominated the land between the Great Lakes, the Great Rift, and the coast of the Indian Ocean. This is where they led their herds on the vast plains of present-day Kenya and Tanzania. Tanzania? Is it not Tanzania? Am I wrong? Have I been wrong my whole life? Probably. As a pastoralist culture, we decided that having an agrarian orientation would be a perfect match. That is also why they have the pastoral prowess as their Ooh. legacy trait, which reduces on 25% the food consumption in your cities. That's quite Within good. Within this agro-pastoral society, the Enkangs formed the most widespread structure of collective housing. Several dwellings were arranged around a central enclosure, used to regroup cattle at night. It was then surrounded by a large barrier of thorny bushes, protecting animals and men from attacks by predators and looters. And kings can be placed in the best spot in your territory to exploit food, providing a bonus from adjacent tides, and also acting as an anchor to build new districts to maximize your growth. Oh, so it acts like a hamlet, like an early hamlet. Although I think you get hamlet around this point in the game. That's a cool district. Size great warriors. The status of Moran represented the highest position a man could attain. Equipped with a spear, bow, sword or club, the Moran were also the only ones allowed to defend villages, kill animals alone, and hunt lions. Equipped with their deadly Rungu, the Moran are implacable warriors that will destroy units that have already taken damage. So do not forget to bring some within your armies to maximize their efficiency. The Maasai are one additional culture for you to shape your own civilization. And leave your mark 
and humankind. Interesting. A useless legacy trait? Are you crazy? 25% population consumption? Um... It depends on how that works. Does that mean like your people eat less food or when you click the labor button, do you use less people? Both of those are really good. <laughs> both of those are both of those outcomes, whichever way it works is really, really good. Um, yeah, I don't know. This it, it, we'll have to see how it plays out in game because there might be other changes to the game that we're not aware of. Um, Nkang plus five food per adjacent exploitation counts as a farmer's quarter plus five food per adjacent exploitation that's really interesting so you want to like build it near other exploitations but not beside them okay all right i'm on board uh and then their unique unit does more damage to enemies i think that are damaged. Yeah, bonus combat strength against damaged targets. These seem quite powerful. Uh, 43 combat strength in the early modern. Seems like quite a lot. They probably come fairly late. They don't seem to take a strategic resource, which is a big advantage. And they look relatively cheap as well. Um, uh, Potato has video evidence of a city's consuming 70-ish food per population. When it gets to a certain point, reducing that by half is pretty neat. I don't think that's by half. It's by a quarter. So even st even so, a quarter a quarter less population consumption is a pretty big deal. <clears throat> uh, no, it's totally used because of how pop food consumption scales. Uh, in the end, it'll mean like five pop. Will it though? Because if your population are consuming less food, it means you're growing faster. And if you're growing faster you're getting more yields and then consequently consuming more food. I guess it kind of, if it'll probably end up being, you, you'll you probably, you probably won't end up with like a hundred more pops, but it'll probably be somewhere in the region of like 10% more population than anyone else in the game, which I think is like a pretty okay, that seems pretty okay, 10% more yields for your population. I don't know. That seems pretty, pretty, pretty good to me. You can't grow more than a pop per turn, no matter what. I think that should be changed. I definitely feel like the one pop per two turns or one pop per turn thing is kind of... Well, it depends on the game speed. That's true. Yeah, I think that the growth limit stuff really hamstrings any sort of growth population chopping build. And I think it needs to be fixed because there's no cap on the amount of production you make. There's no cap on the amount of uh, gold you make. There's no cap on the amount of science you make, really. Like... That should be uncapped, in my opinion. Um, so I think the last one now. We had Bantu, Garamante, Swahili, Maasai, and Nigerian. And then I think the last one will be revealed tomorrow, a.k.a. today, for people watching the YouTube VOD. Um, so we'll get to check those guys out tomorrow when the, when that releases. Independent since 1960, Nigeria has the peculiarity of bringing together in the same state an immense diversity of peoples and cultures. Moreover, more than 450 languages are spoken there, which is a record in Africa. I skipped one. percent the food no i didn't i just watched this one oh i missed ethiopia whoops i guess all six are out never mind <laughs> <laughs> In bad shape at the beginning of the 19th century, 
the Ethiopian imperial authority benefited from the reigns of Don't great post rulers blind in the second chat, half okay? of the Listen, century, which I, allowed I the have significant have territorial expansion. A mild disability I need to ask you, okay? imperial institutions particularly affected the army. The Ethiopian emperors succeeded at the end of the century in mobilizing large, well-trained and well-equipped troops. The increase in the empire's military capacities was the basis of its resounding military successes, which guaranteed so it's a militaristic its independence. Sieve. The legacy traits, military modernization, reflect how well they modernized their army during that time. Ooh, in the defense of that's that an interesting garrison pivots, the emperors could rely on the specificity of the Ethiopian massif. By taking advantage of the Amba's rocky plateaus, difficult to access and often fortified, they recorded brilliant military victories, as on the slopes of the Amba Alagi in 1895. Amba will provide the player the perfect defense on the mountain areas. Their zone of control effects will slow the enemies, which will give you some time to plan your strategy. The Slows down enemy armies and describing gives you them as ruthless this seems pretty good. Deeply marked the European imaginations of the 19th century. Also, their eruption on the battlefields often had a great effect on enemies. Even if they are not known from being numerous troops, the Oromo Cavalry is an experienced regiment that fought many battles. It will be reflected on getting double strength from their veterans level. Oh. In humankind, there are millions Ooh. of culture combinations possible. Each one has... Actually, by this phase of the game, it's really easy to get veterancy levels if you know what you're doing in terms of like setting up your religion and your buildings. You could have plus six combat strength Oromo cavalry running around. That sounds disgusting, dude. Where was that? Hold on. Could be quite strong. Veterans level. In humankind, there are millions of culture combinations possible. Each one has unique gameplay and a rich story, like the Ethiopians. We can't wait to see how far you will push humankind. Oh, right. Well, we'll finish this real quick. I totally forgot to change my category. Um, Oops. Uh, that's not what I wanted to click on. Uh, so in terms of the Ethiopian culture, I like them. A plus five science on garrison, that's interesting. Builds you an incentive to maybe build garrisons early and pivot to Ethiopia. Could be interesting. I know there's a lot of things that buff garrisons in the game. I know there's a lot of civs that have interesting garrisons. You could go Mycenaeans early, pivot to these guys. Um, I think their unique district is probably the least in... Yeah, I don't know. It, it looks cool. Um, I don't know if it has, like, when I... It's cool, but it doesn't really have an impact on the game, it feels like. Maybe, it, maybe it'll be significant, like, in high-level multiplayer or whatever. But it doesn't, it, like, plus two movement cost of units within range of two tile i maybe that's good um plus one combat strength for units in or adjacent to the district that's yeah i don't know i don't know i don't know how good that would be we'll see uh, this doesn't seem very strong this seems pretty good and the armor cavalry seems absolutely busted i'm gonna be real with you guys um militaristic defensive is underwhelming yeah i kind of feel like militaristic defensive is underwhelming because you're kind of expecting people to attack you and you've got like an entirely defensive kind of thing do you pivot to this when you're being attacked i don't yeah i don't know it's a, it's a weird one but it, it, at the very least i like that they're trying different things i think that's cool that's interesting let's do nigeria now independence since 1960 Nigeria has the peculiarity of bringing together in the same state an immense diversity of peoples and cultures. Moreover, more than 450 languages are spoken there, which is a record in Africa. Now 
Nigerian agriculture draws its liveliness from the country's different environments. Although it relies mainly on the work of small farmers, it manages to ensure the food security of this demographic giant of more than 200 million inhabitants. With a significant portion of their population working in agriculture and its importance to Nigerian economy, they will be represented in humankind as an agrarian culture. Ooh. Their legacy trait will allow you to gain some industrial output from your farmers. Since the 70s and the dramatic increase in crude prices, oil activity has been the engine of the Nigerian economy. The country is now Africa's largest oil producer, and its exports provide the federal government with a significant portion of its revenues. This exploitation of coastal oil deposits in the Niger Delta is shown in games through the emblematic quarter, the oil refinery. This district can be built only on river deltas, but will provide you with access to the oil strategic resource, reducing your need to trade for it. The Nigerian army uses all-terrain armored vehicles capable of withstanding explosive attacks, the MRIPs. Designed locally, they adapt to all types of environments and confer protection and projection capacity to the Nigerian forces. While slightly stronger than the APC, the MRIP requires fewer strategic resources than its counterpart. This will allow you to field a strong and mobile force to patrol the territory without relying on foreign resource imports. The Nigerians are one additional culture for you to shape your own civilization and leave your mark on humankind. Um, cool, I like some of what's happening here. I'm going to be real with you. Uh, this output. is trash. <laughs> <laughs> this needs to be like plus 10 industry per farmer's district. This is, needs to be way, 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 way more. Uh, now, that's caveat. Unless the game has changed significantly since this, um, this needs to be way more. Like way more. Um, it should be like plus one industry per farmer per territory on city. Then we're talking about a bonus. Um, but as it stands, I sleep. Um, oil refinery, this is an interesting idea where you can create your own oil. Um, I like this. This is really, really, really cool idea. Um, how impactful will it be? Uh, uh, you know, maybe. Maybe it'll change the game a little bit. Um, the MRAP, I like this MRAP thing. I don't remember how high the combat strengths get in the late game, but I feel like 64 might be a bit low. Um... But it does, it does, this feels like a well-designed sieve in the sense that all the bonuses are kind of addressing a different area of the, like, it's just, it's really strange. I don't know. I, I, I just don't have enough experience with, like, late game war because all of my experience with the late game of humankind was, like, immediately bypassing the entire contemporary era and finishing the game in, like, three turns. So... Um, I would actually need to, I really need to play the game more to really understand maybe Ethiopia and this sieve. But it's interesting. I like this MRAP thing. I like this. I, I want to like this bonus, but it feels trash to me. Um, and this, this, this I think is really, really cool. Um, will it have an impact on the game? That's a question mark. I think this is a well-designed sieve. I like it. Um, I just think they feel underwhelming. We'll need time to play them. We'll need to see what the balance of humankind is like. Um, but yeah. All in all, from the first DLC of Humankind, like my overwhelming, my overall thoughts on this are, um, I'm excited. I think it's a really cool idea that they've gone with here to focus all on a similar continent and then to go through and do each era. I think that's kind of a neat idea. I think some of these, some of these cultures are kind of miss in terms of like gameplay. They're all cool. Um, in terms of like presentation and stuff like that, but kind of miss in terms of gameplay. Uh, I think in particular, Ethiopia and Nigeria kind of stand out to me as from a gameplay standpoint, being less interesting uh, than the other four. But that's also just kind of part of like being later in the game earlier, see if they're more impactful and have more interesting. Um, I think uh, a lot of my judgment of this DLC pack is probably going to be reserved on the robustness of the accompanying patch. Um, as far as it stands for me, um, 
I don't see like a sieve or a feature here that is like, I want to spend money on this. Hold on. Let me see. How much is this actually? Humankind. Does it have a price out yet? Uh, you know, okay. For $8, I'm I would buy I'm buying this for sure. 100 percent For eight for nine euro, eight, eight dollars, ten dollars, whatever. This feels like an appropriate size and amount of content for that amount of money. Um for sure. Yeah, that feels that feels right to me. Actually, now that I look at it, you get six saves, four natural wonders, seven extra minor cultures, a few world wonders, some natural wonders, a balance patch. This all feels kind of all, this feels about appropriate for me in what I was expect here. There is kind of part of me that would like to see like a big expansion for humankind, like just one or two big expansions. But I'm okay also getting a few of these like little expansions too. Um, I'd like to see a really, yeah. Um, are they doing balance patches behind DLC? I don't think so, actually. I don't think they are. I think Amplitude typically give you the balance patch for free. For, like, all the old stuff. And it's just the new content that you pay for. So, like, you won't get these cultures, but uh, but any changes to the old civs will go through. I'm, like, 99% sure of that. I don't think, I don't think companies do um, paid balance patches anymore. I don't think that's a thing anymore. Because it's just, it's, it's too complicated and weird. Um, it's actually just simpler to like compartmentalize what content people have access to. Overall, the DLC feels overpriced for nine. It's five euro for a Twitch sub. Nine euro for six new cultures, four new natural wonders. Well, it seems. I mean, that seems like it seems to track to me. You got what ten per area in the base game for sixty. You're getting six for ten. Well, it seems pretty good. I think the one thing they're lacking is like one of these sieves needs to be absolutely like really exciting to play. And I don't think there is a really exciting one to play except for the Bantu. I think the Bantu are the most exciting one to play and they aren't even like amazingly exciting. Um, but yeah, we'll check it out. I'm, I'm excited for this. I'm curious as to see what the balance patch will look like. I haven't checked in on Humankind. I've been kind of letting it, letting it sit in the, in the burner. Um, so I can come back with it with a fresh eyes and, and really take a look at it. Um, I, I really like the presentation and aesthetics of this game. And I'm wondering where they've taken the gameplay and some of the bugs and stuff that we encountered. So I'm excited. I'm excited to check it out.